Today we're going to talk about DNA replication, and the goal of this video is to describe the purpose and the steps of DNA replication. So first, what is the purpose? Well, before a cell can divide, the cell's DNA is copied or replicated so that each daughter cell receives identical genetic information. That's the purpose. The purpose is to make an identical copy for each daughter cell. Now, where does DNA replication occur? In eukaryotes, DNA replication occurs in the nucleus. Eukaryotes have a nucleus, and the DNA is inside of it. So that's where replication occurs in eukaryotes. But prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. So for prokaryotes, DNA replication occurs in the cytoplasm. When does DNA replication occur? Well, I have a picture of the cell cycle. And DNA replication occurs during the S phase of the cell cycle. That's this green portion right here. The S stands for synthesis because the cell is synthesizing or just that word just means building uh, that so the s stands for synthesis because the cell is synthesizing or building two identical copies of the dna all right how is the dna replicated so in the remainder of the video i'm going to show you the five steps of dna replication but here's the main idea if you take nothing away from the, the five steps, I want you to know this. During those steps, a series of enzymes work together to carry out the process of DNA replication. So I'm going to name several different enzymes involved in these steps. Don't get lost in the details. Just know that these enzymes work together to carry out the process of DNA replication. Okay, with that said, we're going to get into some of the details here. But overall, big picture, there are five steps. All right, so step one, DNA helicase unwinds and separates the two strands of the DNA, creating a replication fork. So right here, you can see the DNA looks like a twisted ladder. This enzyme called DNA helicase is going to untwist it and separate the two strands of the DNA, creating a fork. And by that, I mean, like, think of a fork in the road. Uh, this is called the replication fork. That's step one. The helicase does this step by breaking the hydrogen bonds that uh, hold together the base pairs. So these little tick marks represent the bases, and they're held together by hydrogen bonds. Helicase breaks those bonds, and that's what allows those two strands to separate. Okay, so this is step one of DNA replication. In step two, <clears throat> single-stranded binding proteins. That's a mouthful, so you'll see it abbreviated as SSRBs. These prevent separated strands from joining together again or reannealing. So they essentially hold the two strands apart. All right, that was step two. In step three, Another enzyme called DNA primase generates a short RNA sequence called a primer to initiate DNA synthesis. So these green blobs that you see, that's the enzyme. That enzyme is called primase, specifically DNA primase. And the blue sequence here, uh, or the, the, the blue strand, that's the DNA. DNA has the bases A's, G's, T's, and C's in it. So these little tick marks, they represent the bases. So pretend that this tick mark is an A, this one's a G, this base is a T, this one's a C. What's going to happen is DNA primase is going to come along and lay down uh, RNA nucleotides that complement the bases in the DNA. So A would pair up with U, G would pair up with C, T would pair up with A, and C would pair up with G. This sequence right here, U, C, A, G, would be my RNA uh, primer. All right. So step number four, DNA polymerase three 
We name it that because there's more than one DNA polymerase. This is another enzyme. DNA polymerase 3 builds a new strand moving in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction by joining nucleotides together. So this circle that you see, that represents the enzyme, DNA polymerase 3. And you can see in the picture that it's adding these red uh, pieces. Those represent nucleotides. You'll notice also that the DNA polymerase 3 is moving in a certain direction. So when it's moving um, toward the replication fork, it's moving uh, in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. This one down here is also moving in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction, but that one's moving away from the replication fork. Remember, I've used this analogy in a previous video, DNA is anti-parallel, like a highway. So essentially the DNA polymerase 3 is driving in this direction on this side of the DNA, on, of the DNA, and it's driving in the opposite direction on the other side of the DNA. Okay, now, one thing you'll, I'll, I expect you to know how to do is uh, determine the complementary strand that DNA polymerase 3 is going to build when you're given the sequence of bases. So let's uh, do an example here. Say I give you a piece of DNA, A, G, C, C, T, G, T, A. That's the sequence of bases in your DNA. And I want you to make a complementary strand of that. So DNA polymerase 3 is going to build a complementary strand. And it's going to do that by adding nucleotides that complement those bases. So here's where you use your base pairing rules. Remember, A always pairs with T and G pairs with C. So as DNA polymerase uh, adds bases, it's going to move in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. So <clears throat> um, you're going to put a T right here because T pairs with A. You're going to put a C here next because C pairs with G. And on we go. Next is going to be a G, then a C, I'm sorry, then another G, then an A, C, A, E. You gotta make sure that the base that it's paired with is its complement using your base pairing rules. A's pairs with T's, G's pair with C's. And again, this new strand that we built, that's called a complementary strand. It's complementary to the original strand that we started with. Okay, so that was step number four of DNA replication. Remember, I told you there were five. Um, but before we get to that, those the fifth and final step, um, the leading strand is synthesized toward the replication fork, and the lagging strand is synthesized away from the replication fork. So notice, we're building a, uh, a strand of DNA here at the top. We're also building one here at the bottom. The strand at the top is being is being built toward the replication fork, so that's why it's the leading strand. The uh, strand at the bottom is being built away from the replication fork, so that's why it's called the lagging strand. When you look at the lagging strand, you'll notice that um, it's not continuous. It's made in like little chunks, so. The, since the lagging strand is synthesized away from the repl replication fork, it contains these fragments. So you'll see a bit of RNA and then some DNA, and then a little bit of RNA and then some DNA. And it's we call these Okazaki fragments. Now, here's where our um, fifth and final step comes in. There's essentially two enzymes at work here. Um, one of these is DNA polymerase 1. It's going to remove the RNA primers on the lagging strand, and it's going to replace them with DNA nucleotides. And once RNA, I'm sorry, once DNA polymerase 1 does that, and that RNA is removed and it gets replaced with DNA, then ligase is going to come in 
DNA ligase. And it's just going to join together the Okazaki fragments. It's Ligase is kind of like the glue. It comes in at the end and glues together these fragments so that you have two uh, continuous strands. So by the end, big picture now, to sum up, we started with just one strand of DNA, but it was unzipped and uh, complementary strands were built. And so you end up with, you st though you started with one piece of DNA, you end up with two uh, identical copies of the DNA. Um, and so I want to finish up by talking about the kind of replication that happened. This type of replication is called semi-conservative replication because each resulting DNA molecule is made of one parent strand, that's the blue parts, and one new daughter strand, that's the red parts. So look at the name. You see conservative in the name. Conservative means we conserved something. So the blue was conserved, but it wasn't uh, completely conserved. It was only partially or semi-conserved because we had to, um, each uh, daughter strand isn't completely blue. Instead, it's only partly blue. The other part is red. So that's where the name semi-conservative replication comes from.